How would you like to follow that? <laughs> I checked with Anna to make sure she wasn't married yet. <clears throat> She's eight years old. Because I think grandfathers ought to be able to make a little connection there. And my grandson happens to be eight years old. And he's cute. So our arranged marriage is coming up. We want to announce that date will be June. <laughs> Hi, my name's Don. It's been a while since I've seen you. Good to see you guys again. Well, not that good, I guess, but it's all right. <laughs> we, uh, we are going through the journal, and we're, if you're following along in that journal, it's on page 27 about making friendship a priority. And uh, I want to give you a word, and then I'm going to go off in a distant chant here for some while, and I'll come back to that word. So stay with me. Are you up for it? All right. Here's the word. Withness. Withness. I'm not, I'm not lifting. <laughs> Withness. We'll come back to that. I don't know if you can believe it or not. It's amazing to me when I think about it. It's been almost exactly two years since we heard this word COVID. Two years ago, it started to be announced and started to have its ravaging effect throughout our, our, our culture, our society, our nation, and the world. Two years. The casualty of these last two years is, is really unimaginable. Loved ones that are no longer with us because of COVID. Relationships that were affected, families, finances, jobs, time that we had with one another that was just pulled right from us. I mean, I, I, I don't lightly tread into this whole area, but there's a certain grief that, that we're feeling, especially since like every new year we think it's going to be over and then it just still, be, still just kind of hangs on and comes up with a new variant and we're back at it again. It will be over one of these days. But the casualties have left a mark. You know one casualty that surprised me that I just, I guess just was brought to my attention in such clarity. I was at a a meeting for pastors this last week, and one of the presenters talked about the, the major casualty of COVID. One of the major casualties is the church. The church. He mentioned that before the pandemic, which was two years ago, and the church today, for the most part, is, is so different that the majority of churches, number-wise, are are still trying to recover from where they once were. And then he said this, which rocked my boat a little bit. He just said, you know what? Probably most churches are not going to recover to the point where they once were. He said this, COVID killed the model of church that we're used to. COVID killed the model of church that you and I are used to. That whatever it looks like coming out of this pandemic, he said the main thing for pastors to do and for us as talking to my group of, of leaders is to be able to resource the pastors and resource the church with this new vision. Because right now it's so hard to get your mind around what's going on. It's hard to have vision when there's so many uncertainties and so much wonderment and so, so much grief and loss, but to be able to get our mind around this new model of what the church is gonna be like. And I got to thinking, I have, no, I have no clue what that new model is gonna be like. I mean, we all have preferences. 
If we were to take a poll, I would ask you, what is the perfect church? Every one of you would have an idea. It would be probably about the kind of music you like, um, the kind of preacher, teacher that you want to hear that, that resounds with you, that rings your bell when you hear. There probably a certain size of church in mind, a certain kind of facility and building decorated in a certain way, certain programs, and, and they're not necessarily good, bad, right, wrong. You just have, you have preferences. You, you feel that way for a variety of reasons, but it's just preferences. So if you were going to re-envision the church, you would have a certain way of doing that. If you were going to plan and strategize to this new season ahead. I would almost trust you more than some of the, uh, some of the experts who are trying to figure this out. They all have ideas of what that's going to look like, and they go down this long line of what this new re-envisioned church is going to be. And as I listen to some of the ideas and listen to all this going on, I got to thinking, I wonder what God thinks. I mean, I wonder, I wonder what his assessment is of the church, and I wonder what, if, he, if he indeed is going to, to help us look into the future, what would he say are the priorities of that new envisioned church. This is what I know. As I read through the Bible, there is usually a disparity between the way God views the, the gatherings of people and the way we view it. In our humanity, we, we have these gatherings and we go, whoa, that was church. 9.8, man, that was, a, that was great. And God might be going, ah, yeah, maybe like minus two. I'm not sure that that even registers with me. You go, what? Are you sure about that? I go, let me just refresh a couple. You go to the Old Testament in the book of Amos. And the church there um, gets these harsh words from God. They're, they're gathered together. It's not a church by then. It's a, a gathering of religious people. And, and they gather together. They do all the things churches do. All the gathering. They, they sing. They pray. They have a message. And here's God's response to them. I hate. I despise your religious feast. I cannot stand your assemblies. It's like, whoa, God. I mean, what do you really think? He says, I, I just wish you would do away with the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the music of your harps. A lot of you are going, I've been trying to turn the music down for a long time, God. I know what you're talking about. Not, not turn it down, not tweak it a little bit. Get rid of it. Why? Because you're not doing what I called you to do as a church, as the people of God. You're, the poor right next to you are, are being ignored. You take advantage of the oppressed and the marginalized in business transactions all through the week. There is such hypocrisy in the people that gather who say one thing and sing one thing and do something completely different. And God just says, don't bother me with your assemblies. You're saying we're doing a great job. And I'm saying, uh, not quite. Malachi is an interesting book where God kind of jumps on their case in, in that book. It's right before the New Testament begins. And a couple guys in the church decided they had a money-saving scheme. For centuries, God had asked the people of God when they gather to sacrifice an unblemished lamb, the best and the finest lamb that they could find, and bring it to the altar and sacrifice it. And as it was sacrificed, it would remind them that their sins are forgiven. And it would be a foretaste of Jesus coming into this world, who will be the Lamb of God, who is sacrificed, who takes away the sin of the world, and it's, it's a picture going into the life of Jesus. A couple guys get an idea like, why, why are we taking our most expensive lambs, taking the church and sacrifice them? Wouldn't we be better off with a little more of a worthless lamb? Blind, lame, crippled, a little bit mangy, kind of leaning up against the fence post, going to die within the next week or two anyway. Couldn't we just take that sheep 
into the temple or into the synagogue or whatever, sacrifice it. I mean, it, it still has symbolism. God still gets what he wants across and it doesn't cost us as much. And God has, has nothing to do with that. He says, are you kidding me? Really? Try that on some of your governors. Try that on some of your leaders. See if, see if they'll take the least you have and feel comfortable with that. It costs you nothing. It's cheap. It's convenient. And you're going to offer that to God? A number of years ago, actually still, every year, Lori and I have this thing called a wedding anniversary. <laughs> Comes every year about the same date. Lori sometimes forgets. I always forget. We used to have a, an annual meeting of, of our church group that met in the Midwest in Indiana, and it was always on the week of our anniversary, and we'd be sitting in a service, and it would dawn on one of us that it was June 17th, and we'd look at one another and go, happy anniversary. Like, this is pretty romantic. We've got a preacher yelling at us the whole time, and, you know... And we're sitting there, and, and uh, one year we were, we were there, and, and uh, one of our pastor friends invited us to Ohio, Ohio, where he had a church, and we were checking out his, his domain, and, and uh, it dawned on me, it, it was June 17th, and I said, oh, man, I need, to, I need to go get, like, a card or something for Lori, because I always forget, and he goes, I got the thing for you, Don, don't worry. In the kitchen, we have this big old bunch of roses we've just had like a men's um, group meeting last day or so and the men were taking roses to their wives and we have all these leftover roses they're beautiful they're still in good shape so we put a bunch together pick out a, an expensive vase from the uh, kitchen cupboard <laughs> in the church probably made of paper I don't I don't know what it was and we put a dozen roses in there, and I mean, wow. Wow. And I come waltzing out of the kitchen to Lori. Happy anniversary to you. I mean, we're singing. It's like a marching band is following us, you know, boom, boom, boom. Fireworks going off, and Lori sees that and melts. I mean, it's like, oh, you remembered. So thoughtful of you. Oh, these are so beautiful. You must have paid a lot of money. And I'm just, yes, yes. I'm going, you know, this is going to, this is going to, there's, I'm going to get weeks, maybe months of benefit from this. This is, I nailed it. And about the time that I'm enjoying this, a guy comes out from the other room and he goes, hey, Pastor Mike, what do you want me to do with those roses back in the kitchen? I can either throw them away or take them down to the nursing home. Which one do you want? The marching band quit playing. The fireworks no longer went off. And Lori looked at me like, what in the world have I done marrying you? It was convenient. It was cheap. And it was a mistake. Because convenient and cheap doesn't reflect my heart for her nor her heart for me. Nothing wrong with the roses. Better roses probably than I could buy. But my heart was wrong. And this is what God is saying to these people. You do all the right things. You have all the stuff there that, that people have when they get to church, but your heart's not right. And in fact, he says, oh, that one of you would shut the temple doors so that you would not light useless fires on my altar anymore. Shut down the temple. I'm tired of useless fires on the altar of sacrifice that are there for the wrong reason. You can go through the New Testament and there's more than one occasion when Jesus gets angry at the gathered people of God trying to have church. You can go all the way in the book of Revelation where he says in there, I spew you from my mouth. I mean, you go through the whole Bible and it's time after time after time, people of God gathering together, thinking they nailed it with the church, 
And God just going, no, you missed it. You missed it. I wonder when we look at this next season that comes to us as a, as a church, I wonder what God thinks. I wonder what he thinks about the church. With that in mind, I want to just give you a couple of verses of scripture that, that give us a little bit of a, a view of the mind of God. In Matthew, the, the 16th chapter, verse 15 through 18, um, Jesus has gathered around with his disciples and they're, they're having like a retreat. There's a, perhaps a bonfire and they're just kind of sharing their lives and, and Jesus leaning back a little bit, he says, hey guys, I'm really curious, been around with you guys for a while now. Who do, who do people say I am? I mean, what's my impact with, with what's going on out there? And they, well, some people say you're like Elijah the prophet. Another piped up. John the Baptist. They think you're John the Baptist. Come back from the, from the dead. Well, Jesus said, what about you? What about you? Who do you, who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. Simon, son of Jonah, Peter, Simon Peter, you usually, everything you say, you stick your foot in your mouth, but this is not from you, Peter. This is from God himself. This is the heart of God. I tell you that you're Peter, on this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Peter, let me just tell you on this rock-like statement that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of the living God, this rock-like statement, I will build my church and not even the gates of Hades can prevail against it. I will build my church. You might just kind of underscore that when you think about the church. Jesus says, I I'm the architect, I'm the originator, it's my ideas, it's my reason, I'm, I, am, I, am, I am the one who's initiating this. I came to this earth, we celebrated Christmas so that I could be with you, God incarnate, lo, I am with you always. With you, with you, with you. I taught you. I showed miracles to you. I went to the, I'm going to the, go to the cross. I'm going to die, be resurrected again, and I'm going to be leaving. I'm going back up to heaven. And it's not like I will not be with you anymore. I will still be with you. And here's how I'm going to be with you. I'm going to leave for you the, the counselor, the comforter, the spirit of, of God. He will live in you. He will live with you. And I'm going to build the church. So that when you gather, I will be with you. In fact, wherever two or three of you gather, I will be with you. There will be this withness between you and me, my spirit, and the church. I am the originator. I will build it. It's not here yet, guys, as we sit around this campfire to his disciples. It's in the future, but I'm going to build it and it's gonna be a work in progress and I'm gonna keep adding to it and I'm gonna keep on building upon it and it's gonna be something that, that, that you, you can't even catch a glimpse of it yet, but it's gonna be a great thing. I will build, and please hear this, I will build my church, my church, my church. I am the, the head of the church, I am the, I'm the lead of the church. I am the one in the church who really needs to approve of what goes on. It's my church. Yeah, but Jesus, I think we should, that's okay, but it's not your church, it's my church. Yeah, but Jesus, no, it's my church. There's been a lot of things that tried to hit and knock down the church. 
I've been in ministry for over 40 years, and they've been trying to bury the church about every 40 of those years. And Jesus said, my church that I will build, even the gates of hell are not going to take it down. My church. When I get to thinking about what the church is going to look like in the future, I'm talking about the big C church, church in general. It's not about me. It's about Christ. It's about what he wants. It's about him. It's not about me. But we make church all about our own preferences the way we used to do it or the way we'd like to do it or the way we've seen it done or the way we heard about it done. But it's really about Christ. Be the leader, be the guide, be the head. So I want you to see what the Lord does as he starts to build that church. If he's going to build it, it's going to look like this. He, he gets after it in the book of Acts. So in the book of Acts, he's gone back up into heaven. There's 120 people gathered in this upper room. And the Holy Spirit comes. The witness of God comes and through the Holy Spirit upon this 120, and it rocks the place. It shakes the place. It's like tongues of fire coming down on each one of them. And they leave that upper room emboldened by the Spirit of God, and they go out into the streets of Jerusalem where thousands of people have gathered from all over the world at a, at a feast of Pentecost where people come back to Jerusalem, and these 120 people start talking about Jesus telling the message of Jesus, and from wherever they're from, whatever language they, they speak, they understand in their own language the message. And then Peter, Peter of all guys, Peter the chicken-hearted, Peter the guy who denies Jesus three times, Peter stands up and gives a message with such power that 3,000 people come and give their hearts to Jesus. 3,000, and in one day, the church goes from 120 people to 3,120 people. They have no pastor. They have no pastoral staff. They have no building. They have no board. They have no bylaws. They have no children's ministry. They have no youth ministry. They have no just about list everything you can of what we think church is. What in the world do they do? What do you do with 3,000 people overnight? Acts 2, chapter 41 through 47 says these words. Those who accepted his message, the message of Peter about Jesus, were baptized. About 3,000 added to their number that day. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the mighty wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All believers were together and had, and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes, ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily, those who are being saved. I, mean, I could talk a long time on that scripture. Probably you're saying you've talked a long time already on that, but I could talk even longer. Let me just give you four bullet points of priorities that when Jesus is building his church, when Jesus is saying, I don't know what all you're gonna do with all the church in the future, but it's gotta have these four things, these four priorities. Here they are, you ready? Teaching, fellowship, worship, evangelism. A church can have a whole lot more than that, but if it doesn't have that, that, those four, it's not a church in Jesus' mind. This is the church he built in order to last until he comes back again. Teaching, fellowship, worship. Evangelism, teaching, the apostles' teaching. They devoted themselves to it. They steadfastly, continually were in 
the apostles' teaching. A lot of people gather together. There's groups that come together and call themselves churches, but they're not devoted to the apostles' teaching. You have the fastest growing church ever in the history of the world was, is, it was, it was established in 2008. The church of Oprah, Oprah Winfrey. In the first week, over 300,000 people enlisted to this church. That by the second week, it had over 2 million people enlisted. Boom, what a success. Well, yeah, except for they weren't, a, they weren't about the apostles' teaching. They would say, doesn't matter really what you believe, there's no doctrinal beliefs. Jesus Christ, he's not the only way to, to God. There's no heaven, there's no hell. Salvation, well, that's up to you. You're the source of that. People eating that up. It's, it's a huge church, but it's not the church Christ built and is building. The apostles' teaching. Worship. Worship, in, in this case, is it's, they're, they're devoted to the breaking of the bread, which means in their own houses and in, together in a big love feast, an agape feast, they'd break bread, they'd eat together. And after the meal, they would stop and say, wait, wait, before we, before we close here, let's go to the Lord's table. And they would break the bread. Remember when Jesus broke bread and he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Remember when he poured the wine and he said, this is my cu the cup of my new covenant poured out for you. Do this. This is the Jesus that we're gathered in before. This is the witness that we have. We worship him because he pulls us into this, this witness with him. And then they would pray for each other and one with another and they were baptizing people and they were praising God and I love this. They, they were filled with the awe of the sense of the presence of God as they saw him work in their midst. Don't you just long to be in those kind of places where you're just in awe, in wonder. God is here with us doing things. Worship. Evangelism. They were being added to daily, daily added to. Not just people coming because they like hanging around them, but added daily those who were being saved. Somebody was talking about Jesus. Somebody was mentioning what the gospel is all about because they would come and they would be saved. And that little word that I love so much in there that is so often overlooked is, is fellowship. And that's where we're at in the, in the journal, fellowship. That little word fellowship, what, what does fellowship mean? Fellowship. I mean, it's the most overused, undervalued word in the, in the church vocabulary for the most part, fellowship. We tag it onto everything, like it sanctifies something. Yeah, the uh, Lawn Bowlers Fellowship will be meeting this afternoon after church, and the uh, Weightlifter Fellowship will be meeting on Friday. The Underwater Basket Weaving Fellowship will be meeting Thursday mornings from 10 to 12. It's like, throw fellowship on there, and it's all of a sudden, it's, it's this holy thing, and it's just a bunch of people getting together for whatever reason. What is fellowship? Growing up, we, we always had a fellowship hall, whatever church we were in, a fellowship hall, you that's where the fellowship took place. On Sunday mornings, you go there after church and there were usually some stale cookies and some fresh brewed coffee. You just didn't know if it was brewed this week or the week before and they warmed it up, but it, it's there and you can fellowship with some cookies and, and donuts and coffee. In the middle of the week, you go to the fellowship hall and there's a carry-in dinner to fellowship with. Some kind of ham or mystery meat of some kind green bean casserole, and an assortment of jellos. And you fellowshiped. What is, what is fellowship? The New Testament word for fellowship is koinonia. Koinonia. It's used like 20 times in the New Testament. It's translated words fellowship, communion, sharing life, connecting, close partnership. 
It's, it's sharing of life, but more than just being together, it's sharing the life of Jesus as we share life together. Because we're with Jesus, we are then with one another. There's a, a withness about our relationship because of our withness with Jesus that is different than any other social gathering, any other friendship. It's not just a social gathering, but it's connected to spiritual matters. It's connected to him. It's the body of Christ functioning like the body of Christ. So that really, all in those four things, fellowship is underlined in all of them. The apostles' teaching is done with fellowship. It's done together. You go together to hear the teaching and the preaching of the apostles. Or they were sitting in a room together in one of the houses and somebody would bring a letter from Paul or Peter and say, here, here's, here's what the, the apostle is teaching us. And they would discuss and, and, and let that come into their life. They, they did it together. There was, when they worshiped, they worshiped together. They, they prayed together. They broke bread together. When they, when they took communion, it was together. You never would see somebody, here, take this little cup and this wafer and go off in the corner and you and Jesus have some time together. No, it's, it's a together thing. It's a fellowship thing. It's, it's the body of Christ ministering to one another. It's never for an individual. It's for the church. It's for the body together. Evangelism took off because of witness. The witness was advanced by the witness. People all of a sudden started to see they could advance the cause of Christ because even in a culture that was turned against them, I mean, you talk about a, a culture today where, where we're no longer the home team, we're the visiting team, where it's, it's, it's sometimes like we're so misunderstood by our culture. Their culture, the, the emperor was Julius Caesar. He'd lop your head off for being a Christian. He'd throw you to the lions for being a Christian. He'd hang you on a cross for being a Christian. And yet daily, you go through the book of Acts, 5,000 men added in the fourth chapter. Not talking about the women and children, how many more? And then chapter after chapter, continually, multitudes, 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 in the worst conditions, because their witness gave them refuge from all the attacks of anybody that would come against them. They knew they had family. They knew they had witness, not only with themselves, but with Christ, not only for now, but for eternity. And with that, it was like a wildfire. It couldn't stop burning. Their witness was advanced by their witness. We, we miss out on that so much today. We become spectators today. We've become people who sit back and it's become just isolated about me and, and no one else. It's, it's, it's just... Um, it's something that we have found with the pandemic because rightfully so, we need to be cautious with the pandemic, but we found, you know what, I can just stay home and watch it and have the same result as being with others. And I think the New Testament people would say, you need to do what you need to do, but it's just not the same. It's not the same. When there's witness, there's 60 times when the one another's take place. Admonish one another, encourage one another, exhort one another, be tender hearted toward one another, forgive one another, love one another. Over and over and over and over and over, one another's one another, one another, one another. You can't one another one another on a podcast. It's a good substitute, but it's limited. The New Testament church thrived in the face of the worst conditions because of witness, withness. There's an old quote in a book that's really a, a classic now by Howard Snyder. It's called The Trouble with Wineskins. It says this, the church today is suffering a fellowship crisis. One seldom finds within the institutionalized church today the winsome intimacy among people where masks are dropped. And this is before literally masks. Honesty prevails. And there's a sense of, communi of community and communication beyond the human. A sense of communication and community 
beyond the human sense of communication and community. Our churches are filled with people who outwardly look contented and at peace, but inwardly they're crying out for someone to to love them just as they are. That's withness. That's withness. Acts says basically this, if you're gonna experience withness, you do it in two ways. They were in the temple courts daily. You don't have to be in the church daily. I won't throw that on you. You might, you might need to be in church maybe a little bit more than what you're used to. That's not a bad idea. But then they were also in each other's homes. They were in large group. We learn in rows. They were in smaller groups. We grow in circles. I know the last couple of weeks there's been a push to to join into a small group, start a small group, become a part of a community group, get into a ministry. And I want to encourage you to do that. I want to encourage you to even go beyond your, your comfort level and get involved. In, and here's the thing that I know from pastoring for so long. I can't do that for you. Your, your pastoral staff cannot do that for you. Your community, community leaders cannot do that for you. That's a choice you have to make. But I want to suggest to you that when you prioritize that and you make that a part of your life, you take on a different dimension in your spiritual walk with Jesus that that takes you to different levels because not only are you walking with him, you're walking with others. And sometimes the voice of God echoes off others. So when you're going through a tough time in your life and you're wondering how to make it and you're wondering if God ever speaks, somebody in your group, somebody in your circle speaks of how God's working in their life and the voice of God echoes off that into you and you start to connect with God through others when you yourself can't seem to get through in your prayers. There's an old illustration that when somebody becomes a Christian, that in order to continue to grow, it's like being a, taking a, a, a pile of charcoal briquettes. You remember that when we used to cook the way God meant us to outside with briquettes and not just gas? Come on now. Hamburgers taste better with briquettes than they do with that fumes. But Some of you are going out, you will not remember any of the other thing. And he doesn't like the way I cook hamburgers. I, I will eat any hamburger you cook for me. But, but they said, if you take that pile and you take one of those briquettes and you, and you take that briquette and you put it off to its side, it won't be long before it loses its heat. It loses whatever flame it had and it, it will grow cold and die. If you take that same briquette and put it back into the pile where the fire is, it will light up again and warmth will come and it'll heat up. And, and here's the thing. Not only does, does warmth come to that briquette, but the fire of the whole group becomes greater and stronger. Not only do you benefit from withness with one another, but our church benefits. We shine brighter when you are withness. When you're, when you're withness, enters into the church, the witness of the church gets stronger. Whatever the values that come up in this next season of the church at large, this is what I appreciate about Mountain Park. I know for the last 30 some years that I've been around you, you are wholly committed to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to worship, and to evangelism. You exist because of those things. And I don't know what God will add or how he'll move it or how he'll shift it, but when you keep that at the, at the core of who you are, the withness of God manifests itself in you. And the withness of Mountain Park will increase its witness to Ahwatukee, to Tempe, to Phoenix, Maricopa, to all this region around. And as you trust God with who's he bringing for the next leader of this church, 
Who's he bringing for what that next season starts? You don't have to just knock your head against the wall trying to figure out what the vision is. Sometimes the best vision is going back to the second chapter of Acts when Jesus Christ himself said, I'm building and this is the priorities of what I build with. And in doing so, you find you have a friend in the church, you have a friendship with God, and you are a person that others seek to be friendly with. Because withness is really Christ in you. Worship team is going to come and we're going to sing another song. Let's pray as we, uh, as we close down the service. Lord Jesus, that you would love us so much, that you would think about us even when you're praying in John 17. Lord, I know the pandemic didn't catch you by surprise. And if there's some changes that come in our church, in our churches, we're all for it. Because we, we, are, we are convinced that you're the head of the church, you're building the church, and it is your church. So with confidence, until you come again, and as long as you tarry, may you find us in withness. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.